so yeah, I'm going to take um, to, to Africa and I'm going to do a, a well, um, part of climate change and, and these issues is, is making us grapple with, with um, big decisions and, and big movements. You know, the, uh, the, Yannick talked about the financial system and then, you know, here in Vietnam, the way we, the way we regulate. And, and now we're trying to think about, okay, how do we, how do we cope with um, energy in, in Africa? Uh, and this is stuff that we've been doing with the Treasury. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about mitigation pathways and, and, and focus a little bit on, eventually we're going to focus on, on South Africa and, and regional options um, to electricity generation and then look at some modeling that we've done, which, uh, which I'm actually uh, quite proud of. I think it's, it's working quite nicely. Um, so this is what I'm going to try to do in the next 20 minutes. But basically, you know, uh, part of the issue is why, why would we be so worried about this and uh, there's, you know, the, the IPCC has come out with their uh, fifth assessment report. And if you go and you look at, uh, you know, what's necessary to be done in terms of global greenhouse emissions reductions uh, by, by 2050, in order to just have a 50% chance of, of keeping temperatures within two degrees, uh, you need to uh, reduce uh, total global emissions by about 25 uh, to 55%, right? Uh, by, by 2050 and then, and then reduce them rapidly thereafter. Um, the, the emissions of the countries of the OECD in 1990 are only slightly more than 25% of, of the total, right? So even if total OECD emissions go, go to zero, then that means, you know, the rest of the develop, developing world, um, you know, has to at least hold uh, emissions at, at current levels in order to make the very low end of the range. And I think Yannick would, would tell me that this is not enough. Uh, so that, uh, uh, that, that's where we're, we're sitting. Um, and so then if we go and we just look at, uh, this is old emissions per capita. Where's the, did the uh, pointer go away? Ah, there it is. And we just take South Africa uh, here, and, and uh, you know, South Africa is emitting more per capita. Obviously, U.S. is right up there, but then China and then India, and and you know, there's not much. Uh, if there is a global emissions regime, you know, South Africa being accepted out of it uh, is 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 unlikely. And so, this is part of the impetus uh, for a lot of thinking. Now, South Africa has actually done really a lot of thinking relative to a lot of countries about emissions paths and energy and, and so forth. And, and it started um, with uh, looking at their, their energy sector and uh, doing some, some planning with some basic models. And this is South Africa. It's blessed with, with abundant and cheap coal resources, which is largely what they, they've used. So most power has come from, from coal. and uh, and you know, uh, they've looked at options, and this is uh, done back in 2010, 2011. So an, a business as usual build out to about 2030 is about $108 billion. And uh, the low emissions plan was costed out at about, a, about $171 billion. So it's, it's, it's significantly uh, more. Uh, cheaper solar might make that cheaper at this point, but nevertheless, um, there are, there are trade-offs here. And I think uh, we'll, we'll get to the conclusion. There's a series of issues with this that, that we wanted to look at. And the one is, first of all, electricity is only about half. So there are opportunities to reduce in, in other sectors of the economy. Um, one of the problems with these uh, sort of energy sector models, they just project fixed energy demand. They don't, you know, the demand doesn't change with price. And actually, demand it changes in a very complicated way with price. So if, you, if you're carbon taxing a little bit, your demand will go down. If you're carbon taxing enough, electricity demand goes back up again because it's the cheapest source uh, for, for clean uh, fuel. Um, and uh, South Africa has uh, uh, maintained electricity import restrictions, which is a bit of a, uh, an apartheid relic and, or a, you know, energy security uh, uh, policy, uh, keeping, keeping uh, regional uh, sources out. And, uh, and there are some, some large regional sources that, that people are thinking about. And, and this is something that um, 
uh, is being considered, uh, uh, large uh, uh, hydropower options. So on the Zambezi River Valley, uh, there's, uh, uh, some, uh, there's electricity potential. There's a fair amount in the Nile in Africa. And then here on the Congo is a tremendous amount of, of electricity uh, generation uh, potential. And it's, it's located uh, just uh, southwest of, of Kinshasa, fairly near uh, the mouth of the Congo River. And, and this is, it's, it's called, uh, excuse me, Grandinga, um, it's very big. So the, the world's largest dam at the moment in terms of hydropower production is the Three Gorges Dam. Grandinga is about twice the size of Three Gorges in terms of, uh, of power output. Um, so it, it would supply more power than, than current demand uh, in, in South Africa. Um, it's actually got a relatively small reservoir. It's largely a run of the river dam. There isn't the, the, the geology to, to, uh, to have the reservoir, but there is the, the force and the flow. Um, and it's about an $80 billion cost, roughly divided between dam costs and, and transmission costs. And, and you know, uh, this isn't an additional cost, right? I mean, the, uh, South Africa is going to spend around $100 billion uh, on, on energy, and it's just a matter of, of where these things are allocated and what are the right things um, to do. Um, but it, 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 that is not, South Africa is not large enough to absorb Grandinga by itself, but it would be the, the largest potential player. And, and I just included some photos just to sort of give a notion of um, the size. And, and this is the Kohorabasa Dam. It blocks the entire Zambezi River it's in uh, northern Mozambique, uh, and that's about uh, 2.1 megawatts. And if we go here to, I, I, yeah, we can see this, okay. This is Inga 2, and this is Inga 1 on the Congo and uh, at the site, roughly, where, where the Grand Inga would be. And these two are only slightly smaller than combined, with this one being much larger than, than the Kohorabasa Dam. And this is courtesy of Google Earth. We go over here. This is the river. That's Inga 2, and that's Inga 1. Uh, there's an awful lot of, of river uh, left over. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very large uh, uh, site. Um, and it brings up the possibility, you know, thinking through time as we, we look out, uh, of a pan-African grid rooted in, rooted in hydropower uh, with uh, production here, here, and of course feeding to, to various locations. This is potentially beneficial for renewables because uh, as we spread across more space for wind and for sun, the more uh, the, the more dispersed your, your sources, the more likely it is it's going to be sunny or windy somewhere, and the more likely it is that you're going to have um, uh, you know, uh, a, a relatively steady uh, source of power coming in. So the, the geographical diversification uh, is potentially important. So we're just beginning to look at this, and we're trying to, we've developed some, some work, uh, which I'll spend the rest of my time looking at, trying to uh, do some modeling of, of whether, uh, just from the South African perspective, this is interesting or, or not. And what we've done is we've taken uh, a model of the South African economy, the, the, whole, the whole thing, and, and these are really useful in terms of looking at interactions and big, big investments. Um, and we also we get prices, we get demand out of it. So we, uh, we know what, what power demand is. We can do reasonably well there. The, these models are, are actually model energy production technologies just, just terribly. You know, for, uh, for example, in these models, we almost always say, well, we'll let you invest in T, comes available in T plus one. But a nuclear plant will take you know, seven, eight years to build, right? So you, don't, you invest in T and T plus one and T plus two, and by the time you get to T plus eight, that's when you get your power. And we don't capture that. And other factors are in there in terms of peak, we're working on annual cycles, electricity demand is very 
you know, meeting peaks and, and so forth. Um, so we merge that up with a, an energy model uh, that's been specifically designed uh, for, for looking at, at the energy sector. So essentially, a lot of the, dema the demand side is coming from the general equilibrium model, and the supply side is coming from these times uh, energy choice model. And basically then we go and we kind of replicate the planning process uh, in South Africa. So we run our, our general equilibrium model out for 30 years. That gives us prices and uh, demand and so forth. And then we say, okay, given that, what would be the optimal energy mix? And then we fix it for a period of time. Then we do it again and, and we iterate forward uh, uh, through time as if we were making a forecast, making a build plan, committing the build plan, going forward two, three, four years, making a new forecast, making a new build plan, and, and committing our way forward. So it's, it's, it's just replicating a, a standard planning process. Um, we find that this converges quite nicely. This is electricity demand in 2030. We just run two scenarios, a baseline scenario and a carbon tax scenario, and we converge more quickly if we do more iterations, basically, if we plan uh, a more, in a more refined way. <coughs> so we run three policy scenarios. One, we just sort of track the business as usual scenario, which is the standard scenario that, that people look at. Um, we do a, a carbon tax scenario, uh, which is US $30 per ton. It's just kind of phased in in $3 increments over, over 10 years. Uh, and we actually generates a, a fair amount of revenue. So what you do with your carbon tax revenue is important. We reduce essentially other indirect taxes, value-added taxes. Uh, and the second one, we lift import restrictions. So we sort of say, OK, there's this regional activity that's going on. What happens? And the third, we combine the tax with the imports. And this is just kind of illustrating what, what can be done. And so we pick up, we get information on total electricity demand. And when we, going out to $30 a ton, we, we bring demand down, we bring price up. If we do the regional option, then the demand and the price are staying relatively constant, slightly low. The electricity supply mix, actually, in this case, $30 is, is not enough to move it. And also, you can see this, the black is coal. And uh, you, get, you have a lot of uh, persistence in the, in the system. Once you've built a coal plant, uh, it's, it's expensive to shut it down arbitrarily. Uh, so by 2025, regardless of what we do, we don't get very much shift in the, in the, uh, uh, the way uh, uh, production goes. By, by 2035, uh, things start to happen a little more. Especially under the tax with import scenario, we get, we get a lot more uh, imports. Um, we get emissions reductions of around uh, the most, about 25% in the tax with imports uh, scenario. Uh, with just a carbon tax, uh, only, only about 15%. And that's relative to baseline path uh, we would need to do. This is principally coming out of um, the electricity sector. What, what we're, when we're doing this with, with Fundi, actually, at the, at the Treasury, and they're principally interested in the, in the economic outcomes, what's, what's gonna, what, what happens under various uh, scenarios. And uh, we get under, for GDP, which is an important variable, we get that the carbon tax, is, uh, a carbon tax alone brings you to about a percentage point lower in terms of GDP. That's not a percentage point. I mean, it's not on the growth rate. So if your GDP were 100 in 2035, eh, under the carbon tax, it would be 99. So the impact on the growth rate is, is quite small. Um, if we do the import policy, we don't, it, it basically what, what uh, is coming out is the, the big hydro is roughly competitive with with South African coal. Um, and if we combine, we actually get a slight boost. And that's kind of technical. Uh, this 
But basically, what we end up with in a, in a tax with, with import scenario is very, very inexpensive uh, emissions reductions. So we have, under these assumptions, essentially, uh, about $20 billion in net present value of emissions reductions at the relatively low carbon price that, that we put in, uh, going up to $30 a ton, uh, and f only for South Africa, but, but almost for, for free if it, if it works out this way. Um, it is, there's not, there's still issues, right? Employment is lower, and this has to do with uh, keeping the electricity price, keeps up uh, uh, capital intensive sectors, um, and, and the way the revenue is recycled. The, the incidence is uh, not the way we would like it to be uh, as currently constructed. So the carbon tax incidence as, ma or as constructed uh, is, uh, uh, benefits wealthier households more than uh, uh, lower income households. So there's still work to be done in terms of setting aside um, policies. Um, but we wouldn't say that we know what's going on with all of this yet, but we do think we have a, a potentially very inexpensive approach for, for decarbonizing and for generating uh, a, a series of potential positive uh, spillovers. So something of a pan-African grid anchored in hydropower, favorable to renewable energy because of these portfolio kinds of effects. And the regional interdependence is both a good thing and a bad thing. If this helps to foster cooperation uh, within the region, then this would be a good thing. But it's certainly, and I think this is, is standard, it's much less straightforward than, than business as, as usual. I mean, if there weren't environmental considerations, and, and Fundi asked me what to do in terms of power production, then the easiest thing to do is clearly dig up the coal and, and, and burn it. We know how to do that. Uh, and it doesn't require uh, worrying about all of this other stuff with, of course, a series of political risks. This is not easy coming across uh, uh, places that are not, DRC is not known for stability, um, coordination issues, uh, and also uh, with, with much of these renewables, we get power, but not necessarily power uh, when we need it. Uh, and, and this is very similar, about the financing and how we deal with the financing is, of course, you know, an open question and uh, very similar to, to all of the technologies that, that Yannick mentioned. This is a mainly upfront cost with then long run uh, kinds of benefits. And, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know if we have these kinds of institutions uh, to yet to, to fully deal with this. Uh, so that's, that's what I wanted to talk about uh, uh, this morning. Thanks, Ben.